John 6, if you will, and let's go to verse number 66. And I want you to stand with me if you can. Brother Jerry, thank you for a great job on Thursday night when I was gone. And I have been excited about getting back in the pulpit this morning. John 6, verse number 66. It's, uh, <laughs> it's not coincidence that this chapter and verse reference is the mark of the beast, 666. And I don't think that it is a coincidence when you read the context of it. It is certainly evil and it has the fingerprints of the devil all over it. The Bible says from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. That is my text and my title, that last phrase, and walked no more with him. Father, I want to ask you today for wisdom, discretion, and grace. Lord, I pray today that you would help me to be bold as a lion, but gentle as a dove, wise as a serpent. May my heart be expressed today in all facets that you have worked on me concerning this scripture. Lord, I pray that it would be clear and that it would be pointed and it would be plain. And so I'll praise you for what you do today. It is in Christ's beautiful name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. We have just concluded one year of 15 days to flatten the curve. Many of you would agree with me that was the longest two weeks of our life to flatten the curve. I remember sitting in the parking lot of the gym where I go. It was on a Sunday morning about 4.30. They are open 24 hours and I get there Sundays early a lot of times. It was about 4.30 in the morning. My good friend, Brother C.T. Townsend, who I was with this week, had just got back from Israel on a trip that I was supposed to be on, but I didn't go. I didn't, didn't want to go, so I didn't go. And he came home early and he canceled their Sunday services at Victory. And I remember seeing that and thinking, what in the world? And I, he and I are very close, and I actually had intentions of talking to him later that day and checking him on that and asking him about his wisdom on that. And so a friend of mine, Brother Lee Ridings, called me. He's an early bird. and He called me about 4.45 and said, what's going on? We began to talk about the beginning then of what we have been going through now for a year. And I remember saying to him on the phone, there is no way that I'm going to cancel services. There is no way. I don't see any scenario in which I am going to cancel our services. And as time does in five days, those words were served up hot on a good plate of crow for me to digest thoroughly. And I know y'all ain't never done nothing like that before. We just didn't know. Things went crazy in a week. And there were so many unknowns. I called several pastor friends of mine that have been around for pastoring 40, 50 years. Some of them, Brother Ronnie Bearfield out in Ripley, Mississippi, same pulpit, almost 50 years. And I said, what do you think I'll do? Brother Ronnie said, well, the testimony of your church is worth more than a couple of Sundays. He said, until we figure it out, he said, well, you just ought to be careful. And so we did. We stepped into a time that is and was unprecedented up until today. We canceled our in-house services and for just... I don't know really how long, maybe a month or six weeks. And during that time, we went online services. I watched as this church stepped up in ways that I could not have imagined if not for that trial and for that trying time. As we went through that change and that transition into trying to minister, though not being in-house, Brother Jerry and I became instantly online experts at 
putting together and broadcasting a good service. We sat down and I said, Brother Jerry, it's got to be good. It's got to be right. It has to be quality. The sound has to be good. And we worked and worked tirelessly to make that happen. And we did every Sunday and every Thursday. I think about the handful that would come in here on Thursday night while we recorded our, our, not recorded, but while we broadcasted live on Thursday nights. And they would space out. I think there was 10 of us all together. And I'd preach and they'd encourage me while I preached. I think about the folks that volunteered to come up here in the week and watch your children and your grandchildren because school was canceled but your paycheck was not. Somebody help me right there. They watched children free of charge so that working parents could continue to make money. During that time, our security team would be here for everything that we did. Recording, child care, whatever it was, they were here. During those months, we gave literally thousands of dollars, upwards of $10,000 to families that had gotten laid off, families that couldn't work, people that were in business for themselves that no longer had clients or customers. We gave thousands to buy groceries and we paid power bills and we paid rent to help the people of God. We sent flowers weekly to our senior saints that could not get out, that could not go. We tried to find every way we could to brighten their lives on a weekly basis. Bought them groceries, put signs in their yard, stepping up to minister to that segment of our church that was so greatly impacted by that pandemic. We allowed families in our church to adopt those seniors. How many of you adopted a senior during that time? Let me see, y'all hold your hand up high. And I want to tell you something, I am super proud of all of these people with their hand up. They called them daily, they sent them flowers, they brought them groceries. Give a good hand to the four that just (laughs) raised their hand. While seniors across the country fell into depression, ours got lifted up on a daily basis. We came together for Easter and hid eggs in the yards of children that could not come here corporately and do that. It was during that time that we started our parking lot service. and Brother Jerry and a handful of men built that platform that we thought we'd use for a month. And ended up being there, I believe, 35, possibly 37 weeks that we preached off of and sang off of. There were times in those months that faithfulness was exhibited in an amazing way. And even this morning, this service is on the radio in the parking lot for people that just need to be extra careful. And I watch faithfulness in the hearts and the lives of people who were committed to doing all they could while they could. They came to the drive-in service faithfully. When we transitioned, many came inside and others still right now in the parking lot, right now that have not missed a service, so to speak, within the last year that we have walked through these waters. As a pastor, I've never been more proud of our church than I have been in the last 12 months. Your giving increased in many cases, was faithful in most cases, and I say praise the Lord for that. We were able to help a lot of people because of what you give on a regular basis, not just meet our needs, not just keep the lights on here and take care of me and Brother Jerry, but we've been a blessing to people all over because of what you gave that was so motivationally imprinted with the words, let's do this. Y'all remember that? I like that. But in the middle of all of that faithfulness, there are many whose life fell into John 6, 6, 6. They walk with Him no more. You realize that America has suffered mentally, depression on the rise, suicide on the rise, 
America suffered physically. I could step around behind the pulpit and prove this. 70% of Americans put on unhealthy amounts of weight during COVID. Amen. <laughs> the first day of quarantine, Miss Amy made a peach cobbler. And I knew it was time to order some more jeans. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Didn't matter when y'all wasn't here, you know. But most of all, America suffered spiritually. And immediately there was a surge in dependence on God. People watching, our numbers were through the roof on online viewing. If we broadcast a live service on a Thursday before COVID, we would have 200 views maybe on a Thursday night. COVID hit, and by 9 o'clock every night, we were in the 2000s of people that were watching the majority of that service. But over time, that fell off to next to nothing. And I've watched people that were as faithful as the water fountain in that foyer die on the vine spiritually over the last year. Some came to the parking lot service because they could come in their pajamas and be here for 35 minutes and gone, and I appreciate that. But now that we're back in house, that same faithful spirit is not there to come listen over a trans over a trans what do you call it a receiver a transmitter in the parking lot. And now they've not been here. We ended that service in November, the last Sunday, and they hadn't been on the property since it's not pajama time on Sunday morning. And as a pastor, that breaks my heart, sickens my spirit. Because they fall into verse 66. You walk with him no more. Now, I cannot stand before the Lord and say that I doubt your salvation if you are not in church through this time. And I can't tell you that you're not saved, but I can tell you that you're not right with God. I can absolutely on the authority of the scripture tell you that if you have not been faithful to church in every possible way, if you did not come in the parking lot service, if you are not listening in the, in the radio broadcast, if you do not watch on Thursday nights, we have gone to great lengths and I can stand before God and say that my hands are clean, my conscience is clear, that as your pastor, I have provided every possible way to minister to people in the last year. And folks that have not responded to that, I don't know if you're saved or lost. That's up to you and God. But I will tell you what I can say. You're not right with Him. You backslid. You've walked away. You're cold. You're lukewarm. You're indifferent. You've become independent of the things of God. And it ought to be scary to think that you can walk away from Him and not miss the one that you've walked away from. I stand before you this morning to tell you that in the last year it has broke my heart to see people that were once a vibrant part of this place no longer here. And I want to say this. Folks who hid behind COVID and there are people that said, I can't come, I'm going to get sick. I can't come, I don't want to catch it. And I get all that, that's why we did all we did. But I watch people say that and get COVID anyway. Okay? I'm just a little tired of bumping into members in restaurants with nine people in their party waiting on a table. No mask. Kids, neighbors, family. And have them in a restaurant tell me why they just can't come back to church because they don't feel like it's safe. Well, tell me what Tell me what Applebee's is doing that we ought to implement. It's a lie. It's a lie. It is an excuse and it is a lie. We had people tell us that they could not come to the Christmas Eve service for fear of getting COVID. And those same people stood in line shoulder to shoulder at Academy trying to buy a hoodie for $30 telling our church members why they wouldn't see him on Christmas Eve. Now I'm sorry, either 
either you are really that off mentally or you are hiding behind an excuse that does not hold water. And I know I'm preaching to the choir, but that's all right. Choir need a little preaching sometimes. Verse number 60 of our text says the reason they walked with him no more. Look in verse 60. Many thereof of his disciples when they heard this said this is an hard saying. Who can hear it? He said something they didn't like. And when he said something they didn't like they fast forward to verse 66 where they walked with him no more. And I want to say to the crowd that walked away because he said something hard, you might as well have because if you couldn't survive a hard saying, you weren't going to make it when he's standing in Pilate's Hall, public enemy number one, and they're about to put him on a cross and take his life. If a hard saying knocks you out of this thing, what are you going to do when persecution is part of it? And I'm just a little weary of believers acting like they'd go to the grave standing for the gospel, but they can't even get out of the bed to stand for the gospel. Amen, preacher. And I ain't picking on nobody. And, and, and this, this may be live in the 11. And I may tag some people when we go live in the 11 to make sure they see it. I'm just a little weary of people acting like they would be a martyr for the gospel's sake, but you won't give him an hour on Sunday morning. Now listen to me. If you cannot come to the house of God when we've got AC, heat, donuts, coffee, padded pews, the best singing in the world, a preacher that loves you, a paved parking lot and a beautiful building, don't tell me we can count on you when it's jail time for being in church. I don't believe you. I just don't believe you. I just don't believe you. I don't believe that you would stand for Christ with with a gun to your head. I don't believe you that you would die for the gospel if you won't live for the gospel. A hard saying was all it took to knock them out. And they might as well, they might as well, because if you can't take a hard saying, you're sure not going to take persecution, which by the way is coming in our lifetime. I believe that. I believe persecution is coming. This was a test run to see what it would take to shut down the churches and see who would conform and comply. And I'll always put the health of our members on the top of the priority list. I'll always respect those that need to be mindful. Can I be honest with you? There's some people that's health is so weak, they they ought not come to church even when COVID ain't around. And I don't have one problem with that. I don't have one problem with somebody sitting in that parking lot. I don't have one problem with somebody wearing a mask in this church. Wear two or three. I know some folk ought to wear full face year round. (laughs) So I have no issue with precautions but I do have an issue with allowing difficulty to put us in verse 66 where we walk no more with Him. Now I want to address something. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25, not forsaking this, listen, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as as you see the day approaching. The Bible says to not forsake the assembling, the coming together of the church. Do not forsake, forsake. Do not forsake the assembling of ourselves. I want to talk about that word forsake for just a minute. The word forsake doesn't mean that you didn't go to church on Sunday when you were on vacation. That's not what that means. Okay? We got folks out this morning. I text some of them. They said, we're spring breaking, man. We're in the mountains or we're at the beach. I said, you picked a good day to be gone because I'm ripping people that don't go to church and we're all going to think it's you. <laughs> so when they come next Sunday, look at them and say, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We're not talking about that. Me and Miss Amy go on vacation in July. We're there two or three weeks. And by the way, it's probably one of the reasons I've been in the same pulpit 19 years. Able to unplug, walk away, refresh. But when I'm at the beach, 
Say what you want to about me. I ain't getting up Sunday morning putting on suit looking for the closest Sunday school. But when you don't go to church on vacation, that is not forsaking the assembly. Let me demonstrate. If I told Miss Amy this week, I said, hey, and I am preaching out of town this week in North Carolina, y'all pray for me. But if I went to her and I said, listen, I'm going, I'm going to the beach this week. I'm leaving tomorrow. I'll be back Friday. I made sure there's enough money in the account to pay the bills and you have something to eat, do whatever you need to and I'll be back Friday and I get in the truck and I go away by myself and leave her here. That's not forsaking. But if she wakes up one morning and I'm not there and there's no money in the account and I'm gone for 53 weeks and she doesn't know when I'm coming back I believe we have moved over into the term of forsaking. Do you see the difference? For you to miss church on vacation is not forsaking. If you take a weekend with your spouse or your kids, occasionally is not forsaking. But when you walk out those doors and drive up that driveway and you don't give and you don't show up and you don't tell nobody or have any intentions or a plan of coming back, that falls into the lines of forsaking. There are folk who are a part of this place, that I pray to God hear this message, who have not gone on a vacation, they have forsaken the assembly of the house of God. And I love what Jesus said in verse 67, look at it. And Jesus said unto the twelve, will ye also go away? You know, I don't think people think about what it does to the Lord when they forsake Him. Jesus said, you also going to leave to the 12 disciples. Well, I love the heart of Simon Peter. And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. You know what Simon was saying? We can't go nowhere and get what you've got. <laughs> I'm going to say that again. We can't go anywhere. I say it in right English this time. We can't go anywhere and get what you have. Amen. Folks, you can't get this sleeping in on Sunday. You can't get this on the lake. You can't get this in the turkey woods. And by the way, I told you I was going on a turkey killing mission. They are on the endangered species list right now because of what I did this past week. <laughs> we killed five. And I'm going to tell you something. I called in two birds for Dalton and CT, Brother Townsend. And they doubled up. They both shot their turkeys at the same time. And I have a confession. I may have a problem because I cried when they both killed their turkeys. I got so emotional I was crying as these birds are flopping around. But see, that's not a spiritual thing because in about an hour and a half, I was mad because CT shot a bird and I didn't. And then pride, you know, and anger was built back up. So you can have emotional experiences, but you can't get this anywhere else. And Simon Peter said, where are we going to go to get this? And you know what makes me think? When these people walked away from Jesus, where did they go? They went back where they came from. And if you're not walking with Him, you're not going to be with Him when push comes to shove. And on, on the cross, that crowd was nowhere to be seen. That crowd was nowhere to be found. I'll end with this. Come on, Brother Jerry, I'm done. I'm even going to stop my timer. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 5, For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Can I tell you what a blessing it is to know that in our unfaithfulness we have a faithful God. Amen. And I'm not mad at people that have walked away. I'm broken for them. My heart hurts for them. But I'd like to say to them, and I'd like to say to every one of you, we ought to be faithful because He's faithful. And when we have forsaken Him, aren't you glad that He's not forsaken us? And y'all, and I'm, I know this morning the crowd I just preached to has been, for the most part, faithful. Y'all have been pretty faithful. But we had some that was hit or miss, here or there, you know, convenient deal. Some storms came. Some trouble showed up. Some shaking 
entered their world. Boy, they found the church on the dirt road pretty quick. And I'm not critical of that. That's what it's for. That's why we're here. But I don't want to be found flopping. I want to be found faithful. I don't want to be in one day and out the next. I want my son to know. I want my neighbors to know. I want my life to have a history of being faithful to the things of God. Dalton played baseball all the way up through Little League. And he and Miss Amy have come in here on two wheels with mud in their cleats on Thursday nights a lot of times. And I've let him miss Thursday nights to play baseball. You say, Pastor shouldn't admit that. You know what I told him? I said, son, this is the exception, not the rule. It's okay to have an exception, but you also ought to have a rule. And the people in your house ought to know that God's number one. The church is not an option, it's a priority. And we're going to be faithful. And we're going to give and we're going to go. And our lives are going to be built around the things of God. Do you agree with that this morning? I want you to stand up with me. I didn't preach it on this angle, but Palm Sunday. Y'all remember what they did on Palm Sunday? Hosanna, Hosanna. Glory to God in the highest. (laughs) The Messiah has come. Woo! That's Palm Sunday. But give them a week. The same crowd that cried Hosanna was crying crucify. You know what I want to do? I want to be found at the foot of the cross still crying Hosanna when the rest of society is crying crucify. And I think you do too. I think you do too. Can we do two things? Can we come pray, Lord, Make me faithful. Burn that in my spirit. And can we come pray for our fallen brothers and sisters that we love, but they've become the victim of their own poor choices? Everybody in here has got problems, but thank God we got problems at church, not problems at home in the bed. We're not better than anybody else. But thank God we know where to go because we are a mess. Let's pray for our church family. Churches are back and the average statistic is back to 60% of attendance. And don't tell me it's COVID because we had people come see the Browders that we hadn't seen since last time the Browders were here. Sorry, we can't afford to have them every Sunday. So either just be faithful because you love Jesus or show up when your favorite group comes to town. I want to cry Hosanna all the way to the cross. (laughs) I want to cry Hosanna when he's in the grave three days. And I want to be there crying Hosanna when he gets up and shakes the whole world and defeats death. Let's be faithful. These teenagers are here. I love them. I love these teenagers. Half these boys have been staying at my house. And I love them. But boys, look at me right here. Faithfulness don't start when you're 25 with two kids. Faithfulness starts when you're 14 you make up your mind you're going to love Jesus the rest of your life. Oh yeah. Be faithful. He's faithful. We ought to be faithful.